Well, here's a request that came in by email. Uh, this person says, I read somewhere that you do not need to learn how to paint trees, skies, rocks, and water. You need to learn to see trees, skies, rocks, and water. I understand that this is also what you always advise us to do. Would you please elaborate on how to see and what exercises we need to do? Yeah, it's all about how to see, not what you see. It's easy to get stuck on what it is. A cute white puppy. Grass around the puppy. Those sorts of things. But if you stop right there and then you guess how to do it, it's, it's just that, a guessing game. So I've come up with a little acronym for how to see. Now this is how. This is when you're looking at the subjects around you. Just when in your everyday life. How to learn to see like a painter sees. Not just looking at stuff and feeling inspired and that kind of, well, I won't say what. Anyway, so the acronym goes CDD. Well, you can remember that. Learn to compare, learn to detect, and learn to distinguish. Now, those three apply to guess what? Visual elements. You know why you see? Why you see anything? The visual elements. The way the visual elements are working together enables you to see what you see the way you see it. So then if we f look beyond what it is and look for what the visual elements are doing, not just that, that it's a visual element. Value doesn't mean a thing if it's not doing something. Neither does color. So let's go through these little, this little list I've made of how this acronym works and you can try some exercises like I'm going to show you here. So I'm going to build the exercises he requests into the explanation. So we first of all, we see we learn to see by learning to compare. Now compare means when there are two things together, no matter what they are, how are they alike or how they, are they different? Are they very if if they are different, how different are they? Are they just a little bit different or are they really different? So that's learning to see by comparison. And when you when you compare whatever you're looking at with something around it or next to it, then you have something to build your comparison on. You're learning to see. Value, for example. Value is the first element or the element that enables you to see anything. Light and dark. Without light and dark, you don't see anything. Too much dark, you can't see. Too much light, you can't see. So we have all those degrees that enable us to see. So what do we look for? We compare values. So uh, what does values mean? It means that how light is this grass compared to how dark the shadow side of this puppy is. How dark is this grass compared to how light the light side of the puppy is. How light is this compared to the middle value of the puppy. And so one way you can, and one exercise you can actually do, well, if you are just training yourself to see, it's a good idea to have some sort of little prop. Now, of course, we have the value scale. Well, a prop is, now this is, I don't, I, I inherited this. I don't know where it came from, but it's a good little prop. But you can create one of these where just on a, a three by five card, you have the white already. Mix a middle value gray just with black and white, and then use just plain black. Put them side by side like this, light, middle, dark. And then if you close one eye and sort of squint and hold this up right next to what you're looking at, then you're better able to read the value of that. If you, if you 
develop a little tool like that to kind of help you along, like the training wheels on the bikes we had when we were kids, uh, then you eventually begin to learn to see differences in value and begin to control those. And then when you're painting, you ask that same question. So if we're painting this against this, for example, well, let's just see what we would do. So there's the darkest dark. You can see it right here on my brush. And what you can see that darkest dark is, is darker than the dark of the shadow. Let's get it just a little bit lighter and compare it. And see this, you can, you can do this while you're painting in the same way that you're comparing what you see out there. So I changed the value. I made it a little bit lighter, not much. So we've, we're working right here in this area of the value scale. And you can see then that we have that comparison. I got it on the wrong side of the brush. There we go. So we can put that down then and pay attention to what the value is when you put it down. So I might do this. I can hold it up like this and compare it. And then if I put that value down right there, you see I have nothing to compare it with except the white around it. But then if I add, I can see that this is lighter than this. And how much lighter is it? And so then I can begin to add another value to it and see. And now on the palette you can't really see that. But if you hold this up against that, you can see, well, it looks lighter here, but it's not really, it's not really, I haven't really made it light enough. And so we'll add some more light to it. Try it again. And you see, I can squint to that, still not quite light enough. So sometimes, just by comparing what you have on your brush to what you're looking at, is going to guide you in seeing the right, seeing seeing the, the value relationship between one area and another. Just like you learn to see it in the areas in nature or wherever you're looking. Instead of looking at it as grass, as puppy, you're looking at it as value. So seeing those values, and let's, let's see, have we got it yet? That needs to be just a little bit lighter. And of course I'm dealing with color in, in, uh, uh, the, in the characteristics of color here too. Let's get that just a little bit lighter. In fact, I'm pushing really, really, really harder now. And see, now we're getting closer. But you can see when you make that comparison that your, your value might be, need to be adjusted just a little bit according to what you, there it is, according to what you thought originally. But when you make that comparison, it's not just a matter of the color, but when you squint, how, let's put it right next to it, just like it would be right there. There we go. There we go. Now we get that comparison. This to this, and I squint, and I have a very close relationship of value. And then, when I'm looking at on the value scale here, is you. Let me just show you. We have that, that right there. It's about a value four in that grass, and about a value... Eight, seven, eight. Okay. See the difference there? So that is your comparison or, or a method you can use for, for comparing the values. Look at the two values and compare how dark one is to the other first value. You don't have to give it a number. Use a guide if necessary. Then try to mix that comparison. And so, so thinking about value like that, looking at the images where you're looking for the value, it's going to make all the difference in the world. Okay, one of the, the second comparison, the second thing in our visual world that we compare are sizes. How large is something as compared to something else? And one good example here is the comparison of the size. Let's just put, look at this. The size of this eye compared to the size of the nose. Uh, usually, if people are not comparing they'll make the eyes too small and they'll they'll change the shape but I'll talk about that in a moment but they'll make the eyes too small uh, and sometimes they'll put them too high on the head but if you compare the size of this to the size of this 
you see there it really is about this is about three times wider in size so comparing the size of whatever you're looking at and a good way to do that is look through trees in the woods or look through anything that's standing vertically houses in a row where you're looking down at a row of houses and use your this is an exercise now use your fingers to compare the size so if I'm looking at uh, a row of houses and I'm, and I'm putting on my finger the bottom of the house where it touches the ground might be right here on my finger. The top of the house uh, might be right here, say the top of the uh, corner wall, whatever. And then I just look behind it. Now let me show you how to do this. Look at the next house behind it and compare that size and you might find that the top of the house on that side is right here and the bottom is right there. You see what we've done there? We've moved our fingers, we've used our fingers as a gauge. If you've got fingers, you've got your tools right there. And you can go, <laughs> you can go around the world uh, comparing sizes and do it however you turn, how, whatever direction you see things moving. The spaces between trees, uh, the width of trees, that's a really good one to use your fingers for where you see a tree in front and you can do something like this. You see what I'm doing here? Uh, that would be the first tree. And then you look at the one beside it. And you might see that it would be take up only half of that space. So learning to compare sizes, being aware, and not only the width of the tree, but the space between it. Not only the height of those houses, but if there is space between them, the size of that too. So looking at things in terms of sizes and doing things that actually help you to register that size comparison. So those are the two main visual elements that uh, we benefit from, uh, benefit by from comparing. Then we go to detect. What visual elements do we benefit more by detecting? Detecting means we're acting like a detective. We're discovering what's there. Direction is one of the first ones. Direction isn't everything. It's either vertical, situated vertically, it's situated horizontally, or it's situated diagonally. Now one way that you can detect is again with your finger. Uh, you can hold your finger like this and align it. As you look at the way something is uh, positioned, you see this puppy? Positioned vertically. So as you look at the way something is positioned, you can align your eye, close one eye so you can see it better, and you see that's vertical. Or if, you're, if you see a mountain range, you're not quite sure what the tilt is, position your finger and look over your finger and align your finger with that mountain range. You'll see it's diagonal. Now with diagonals, we have variations, all different kinds of diagonals between a vertical and a horizontal. Uh, and, and so, but with horizontals, we don't have, if a horizontal is always horizontal, vertical is always vertical. So detect what direction. That means not just the orientation of the image itself, but it means the shapes within the image. So if you see right here, for example, if we detect, if we detect the, the direction of that ear, we see it's moving like that, just that far, but then the direction changes and it moves like that. So we have a diag uh, two diagonal, two distinct diagonals, uh, so you just wouldn't make an ear like that, but you detect the direction. Now you can see if you detect the size or deter, uh, compare, you've compared the size. If you detect uh, how, how short this is compared to this, then you have that comparison of size. You see how these fit together? So the detecting of direction, the detecting, and that detecting of direction is going to enable you also to detect the a, a, edges of shapes. The edges of shapes First of all, what's the character of the shape? If you see something you think it's round, is it really round or is it made up of edges that have angles to them? So uh, the two kinds of shapes we have, curvilinear and straight. Every other shape is made up of combinations of curvilinear and straight. And so detecting that, where is the curvilinear, where is the curvilinear, where it's a straight. And, and the edges, are the edges, how clear are the edges? 
Are the edges fuzzy and jagged or are they absolutely crisp? So detecting the edges of shapes. And that you do, you can do with your, with your, uh, the edge of your brush or you can do with your, your, your finger like this. Now you can do this where you see the edge of something. If you close one eye, then you can use your finger, what I call phantom drawing, and just follow the edge of the shape and you can, det you can detect then, is it curvilinear, is it straight, and in which direction is it moving? And detecting colors. Now, in order to detect colors, you need, to de you need your crutch, you need the color wheel. And that's a lesson within itself, it's a course within itself, it's a book within itself of detecting color. But learn to call the color by its hue, first of all. Not beige and, and um, pink and, and colors like that, but learning to call it by its hue that you see on the traditional color wheel, and then detect it. Detect it. Discover what's there. That green we're looking at there, that's not a blue-green. That is a yellow green. You can see the yellow in that or the yellow green in there if we look and compare the color well with it. What do we see in the shadows of that puppy? You might say, Gray, well, I see some color in there. What is that color? So if we just move the color well around, we will be able to detect that color is really in the violet to blue violet range. Do you see that? You can detect it when you learn to look for the hue of the color. Now, if you'll go to diamondsacademy.com right there one of the first things you'll see is a free video lesson on how to use the color wheel and so I advise that that might not be a bad idea learn to depend on the color wheel as a painter it's your best friend so that's the comparing and the detecting and things that you can do to enable that and then there is distinguish now the st distinguishing and and detecting and comparing, they are very closely related. But when I say distinguish, I'm really talking more about textures. What kind of textures do you have? We have all these other things working, but then within them we have a characteristic called texture. Is it smooth or is it busy? And I like those two words to describe textures. So if it's smooth, you can see, you, you can get that tactile feeling or of just how would it feel if you run your fingertips over it. And if it's busy, that means it's going to have lots of action in it. In many cases, it's going to be ch lots of changes in direction. If it's smoother, more likely it's going to have very little detectable direction, or it's going to have a direction that's all, they're all pretty much moving in, a, in the same way. But look for patterns within textures and look for the, the differences in the textures to distinguish the difference between the really busy textures that we see here and the smooth textures here. The really busy texture here and smooth texture here. Now, the, usually the, the uh, people who are there looking at something like a puppy, they'll just think fur, fur, fur. And so what we see a lot of times, and we'll see a, a lot of brush strokes going in the same direction. And now we're going to go to the full language but if you will just take your, the handle of your brush at whatever you're looking at, whether it's photograph or out there, if you take the handle of your brush and just look at those little individual patterns, what do you see? You see they're, they're varying in the direction they're moving. They're not all moving in the same direction. And the same thing is true with grass. How many times have I seen it? Tall grasses all going in the same direction. But if you look, compare, distinguish, you'll see that those grasses are changing in direction. Some of them are going like this, some are going like this, some are bent over, some are shorter, some are longer. But in, within that you have a texture of light and dark and it's moving in a pattern. Now I might have made, not have made that really clear about the textures. The textures are uh, a surface quality. It, it's something that you look for as a pattern of surface quality, but look at what textures are made of values. Lots and lots and lots of values. The busier the texture, the finer the texture, the, the smaller the sizes of the, the value, shapes of value that are in there. So 
those are the ways I see that those are the things I look for when I'm uh, when I'm looking at nature like a painter I'm looking around me like a painter and it's the kind of thing little exercises you can do anywhere you are you don't have to be painting to do it you don't have to be drawing to do it but you can do those exercises uh, wherever you are just simply by comparing values and sizes and just take maybe one or two at a time or learning to detect what what direction is that positioned in I like to say what direction is it moving in uh, and looking for the kinds of shape what are those edges of shapes doing uh, looking for the, the the differences in color the kinds of color as they are uh, as they appear on the color wheel how much of a, a hue do you see in that color and of course the textures what are those little patterns of movement when we have really really busy stuff going on or when we have smoother stuff going on give it a try see if it, that doesn't teach you how to see be sure and view all of our quick tips while you're doing so subscribe to the channel click on the bell so you'll always get a notice when we produce a new quick tip which is every week and if you have a question leave it in the comments section and we'll make a quick tip for you also take a trip over to dyingmize.com where I have full length lessons downloads, DVDs, lots of other stuff there, some free stuff for you. And while you're there, you can subscribe to the newsletter, and that way you'll always be informed every time we do something new.